with the UN regional commissions yesterday, really emphasizing how important interconnection is to facilitate the energy transition. Um, there are a lot of commitments and high level statements made about how important that is. Today's session is a little bit different. We're really gonna get down into the, the nuts and bolts of how do we enable that transition. Uh, First, starting from a high level perspective, what are some of the policies and enabling conditions to get us there? Um, and then an even more granular session where we talk about some common misconceptions about the energy transition and really get into some of the technological uh, solutions that are available and some common misconceptions about those. So I hope you're all ready to put your thinking caps on. Uh, we're at Columbia University. Um, the Dean was meant to open us up today. He's running a little late, but he will join us momentarily. So. We'll welcome him when he comes in, um, but very much you're in an academic institution. So this is gonna be hopefully a, a thought provoking session. Um, we aren't gonna have much Q&A, uh, but you should all know we are gonna have a reception right afterwards, uh, right downstairs. So you should keep your questions uh, for the speakers because you'll be able to ask them during the reception. Um, and we're also on Zoom. So hello to our virtual audience. Um, if you have any technical issues, we do have staff online to help you. Um, and you can also submit your questions and we'll try to get them to our speakers over email after the event, but we won't be doing a Q&A with you, unfortunately. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Emma Torres, our SDSN's head of our New York office, uh, and also who leads our science panel for the Amazon. Emma, would you like to come up and open us up? Uh, thank you very much, Elena. This is very exciting. I'm just coming after a meeting that we had of the science panel for the Congo Basin. So it was very exciting because they, over there we focus very much on forest, but tropical forests are, as you know, critical, critical to meet the targets of the Paris Agreement as well as the biodiversity targets. So, but I'm very happy to be with you and talk to the other side of the equation, which is the issue of decarbonization, which is also obviously the one critical part of the of the Paris Agreement and, and as well as of the pathways that we need to do as we move into implementing the sustainable development goals. Um, I would like to thank in particular our partners here uh, Geico, which is we've been working with us in many, many areas, but I, we're very happy that you join us and that and in these interesting brainstorming events, as well as with Climate Works and of course our UNIDO partners. UNIDO is a critical agency of the United Nations in this field. Uh, I'm privileged to have worked all my career practically in the UN, and I always loved it, it, the uh, the leadership that UNIDO had in many fields and obviously now in the transition. As, as you all know, Sustainable Development Solutions Network is a global network. We have over 2,000 2, universities that are working with us. And the main goal is you know, to support the implementation of the SDGs as well as the Paris Agreement. So since 2015, we have been working a lot of areas related to decarbonization, and in particular under the leadership of Elena, we have been working on digging deep, more deeply into the policies and technologies that enable uh, zero carbon pathways. So I'm very pleased that today, together with a number of uh, members that have been here supporting us in this, leading us into this, like uh, Vijay Mode and others, uh, we are going to be really going into a brainstorming with the academic community, scientists, engineers, and industry leaders into shedding light into a new and innovative ways of how we can work together to pathways of decarbonization. We will hear about key uh, uh, geopolitical barriers and strategies to overcome the pathways. And I think this is critical to discuss these issues. Uh, much of these conversations, I believe, will focus on some of the world's largest emitters, but we should also focus on all the countries, obviously, because all the countries need to make the case to do the, the Belen, 2030 is uh, 2025 is going to be a critical moment where all the countries come with their with their indices of how they're going to get into those targets. And I think this is again is important for obviously the large emitters, but it's important for every country. Uh, 
this this event, as you all know, is is held alongside of the high level political forum of the United Nations, and this is critical because we and the United Nations we're all moving towards the September Summit of the Future. The Summit of the Future is going to deal with many issues critical for the future of the multilateral global cooperation, but certainly decarbonization is being going to be a very strategic element. So I'm very pleased that you all are going to be discussing and, and indicating some advice and support that we can be the countries in this field. Thank you very much, Elena. Thank you very much all. And I'm very looking forward to your discussions. And thank you, Emma, who literally just got off of a flight. So we're really excited to have you. Um, Dean Shama, I think I saw you come in. Would you like to come up and share some words? Thank you so much for coming down uh, and joining us. And also thank you so much for allowing us to host this event in your lovely campus. Hi all, pleasure being here. Um, I, I am a mess. I didn't get off the, the, the plane. I got off a, a, a half hour detour in the New York subway system that was totally involuntary so i'm i'm a, a bit of a sweaty mess because it's hot down there um good afternoon so uh, my name is jeff shaman i'm the interim dean of, of the climate school here at columbia university and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this un high level political forum side event uh, global race to decarbonization and debunking misconceptions on key technologies i don't think i need to elaborate to any of you with why we need to be here and why such an event is important Obviously, we're seeing record-breaking temperatures throughout the globe. The global average temperature over the last 12 months has exceeded anything that we've seen. Um, I'd like to point out that last year in uh, roughly July, I think about a year ago, the Persian Gulf Airport in southwest Iran recorded a heat index of 66.7 degrees Celsius, which is really extraordinary. We're seeing enormous temperature spikes. And so decarbonization, of course, is critical. Uh, it's critical that we transition to a net zero economy and energy transition is a leading priority for the climate school here at Columbia University. Uh, our faculty and researchers recently came together uh, to put together a strategic framework for the school and they identified a number of what we call action collaboratives, which is advancing research and taking that research into practice. And those areas that were they identified in broadly are food, water, disasters, the built environment, and of course, energy. Uh, and energy is the big one. Society has to transition away from fossil fuels. And this is a technological challenge. And I think we're ready to talk about that here today. It's imperative that society identify viable, scalable solutions that we vet and back those technologies financially, and that we de-risk investment in them so that we can accelerate their uptake. However, I think it's also important to note that the problem is not purely technological. Uh, it is also a social and economic and a political challenge. So we really need actors from all sectors working to actually address this. This is truly a transdisciplinary problem because the impediments to investment, to technology transfer, and to social adoption are great. And we need to overcome them if we're gonna move quickly, which we really need to do. So transdisciplinary events, such as the engagement here today, are really critical for this. I imagine that a common theme during today's discussion will be the importance of policy, multilateralism, and technological solutions coming together. And again, I want to stress that that also is in line with what we're trying to do with the Climate School, which is really to educate, to research, and to foster collaboration among engineers, scientists, humanists, policymakers, lawyers, financiers, et cetera. Uh, and we need that because if we're going to build more efficient batteries and improve storage, if we're going to identify the barriers and opportunities for adoption of different carbon storage and use opportunities, including geological storage and nature-based solutions, we're going to incentivize the social uptake of renewables. And if we're going to overcome the legal barriers for redoing our grid and for permitting and for getting the adoption of those renewable energies, we're gonna to need to work together and we're gonna need people who are really educated about the problem who are out there in the workforce in all sectors. So the Climate School, we're committed to accelerating the equitable transition to such a future. Um, I also wanna point out that we have a number of our actors here today. I see Vijay Modi over there. I also know that Melissa Lott, who you'll have a chance to hear from later this afternoon as well, is helping lead our approach to addressing those critical challenges within the Climate School. 
So it's been a pleasure to work with the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and the other co-organizers to put together this critical convening. And if I can do one last plug, I'll note that convenings are something that we're really proud of at the Climate School and is something that we do. We are uh, have hosted a number of events and continue, includes the American Geographical Society's annual event, AGS 50, work on climate mobility, on managed retreat. We have a conference on extreme heat going up on 125th Street, started yesterday, it goes through tomorrow. Uh, and we have events, of course, during Climate Week. It's important that we provide that critical space for transdisciplinary dialogue that can bring research to action. And we plan to expand those offerings in the coming years. So I welcome to you, you to this event. I hope it proves to be successful and informative. I'm going to go over in the corner and try to stop sweating. And I'm going to turn it back over. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dean. And, and don't worry, we've all been sweaty all week long, so it's no problem. Uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Xiaowan Chung uh, the, uh, from Climate Works Foundation, our other organizing partner. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Elma. And uh, uh, distinguished uh, Mr. Jeffrey Shaman, uh, Mr. Elmo Torres, and Mr. Chen Zhiqiang, and uh, honorable guests uh, and participants, uh, it's uh, really my great uh, uh, pleasure to welcome you uh, to this uh, important uh, event. Uh, and today we're going to focus on this important topic of the global race uh, to decarbonization and debunking the mis uh, uh, misconception on key technologies. Uh, my name is uh, Zhang Xiaohua. Uh, I'm very privileged, uh, privileged to serve as a representative uh, of the Climate Works uh, Foundation. Uh, we are uh, an organization dedicated to advancing uh, innovative solutions uh, to combat uh, climate change and promote sustainable development. Um, through the strategic grant making and partnership, Climate Works support the initiatives that uh, drive a systematic change in key sectors such as uh, energy transportation industry uh, and also accelerate the transition uh, to the low carbon economy. Uh, our mission aligns closely with the goal of today's event, and we are committed to advancing the ado adoption of renewable energy technologies for a more sustainable future. Our, as we all know, driving the development of renewable uh, energy, uh, sorry, energy uh, has become a global consensus. The COP28 last year reached the historical uh, UAE consensus calling for transition away from the fossil fuel uh, to achieve the global net zero emission by 2050. Uh, in the meantime, all countries uh, are committing to tripling uh, uh, global renewable energy capacity by 2030. Uh, however, as the report by the Col uh, Columbia Law, uh, Law School uh, revealed, the, the misinformation and uh, coordinated uh, disinformation that had uh, at times under uh, undermined the, the support for renewable energy projects and uh, e electrical vehicles. Uh, that's why we gathered here and to further debunk the uh, false claims that are related to the energy transition and to deep dive into the best practice to accelerate the regional uh, energy, clean energy transition. Uh, moreover, tripling the renewable energy target is, is not just a, a numerical change, actually, as we all know that the um, independency of the renewable energy requires a much more higher uh, degree of flexibility capacity uh, of the traditional grid system. High penetration of renewables will bring out the, the systematic and the revolutionary change to the traditional power system. Uh, on the uh, other hand, those uh, revolutions could also bring innovative solutions and opportunities. Uh, the distributed nature of the renewable energy can generate uh, solutions that can uh, simultaneously uh, uh, achieve the clean energy transition, uh, but also can achieve help achieve the sustainable development goals. In fact, we have already seen many more of such solutions such as the solar plus approach, uh, including the solar fishery, solar agriculture, this generates a new uh, application scenarios uh, for this uh, uh, renewables and uh, those can uh, uh, develop the business model for both clean energy access and economic uh, development. Uh, 
And we see that the uh, uh, intelligent energy management system empowered by a new ICT technology that can effectively reduce the peak load, but also manage the, the energy uh, consumption more effectively. And uh, we saw this a larger scale of the installation of the solar PV that in the desert that not only generated additional energy resources, but also greatly improved the local uh, ecological uh, environment. While some exciting progress has been made, many developing countries still face the very various of the challenges and bottleneck in terms of the policy development, uh, finance, technology, infrastructure, supply chain, and the skilled uh, workforce, uh, etc. Um, and mean, uh, meanwhile, the uh, deterioration of the geopolitical situation has led to many challenges that uh, uh, can be avoided. Uh, to accomplish the global goal of the transitioning away from the fossil fuel and the triple renewable energy, it is urgently needed to share the best practices and experiences. It has the uh, international cooperation in order to really uh, achieve the real uh, breakthrough. We believe that by working together, we can unlock the transformative power renewable and build a world that uh, with the prosperity and sustainability. We need to continuously create cutting edge technologies and new management mechanism for integrated solution from the power source, grade, load, storage perspectives to speed up the coal to clean transition. We need to mobilize the funds to, to support the developing countries while also striving to create innovative business model for renewable technologies. We need to work together to build a more robust supply chain for the benefit of addressing climate crisis instead of creating more man-made barriers. We need to make more efforts to expand our global renewable training capacity, particularly in the developing countries. Uh, it can provide more job opportunities to the local community and also boost the deployment of renewable in the, in the region. We need to more innovative solutions, but also platform to exchange, disseminate, and replicate. Uh, Climate Works Foundation is deeply committed uh, to supporting this journey, and we are prou uh, proud to partner with the uh, GEDCO, um, the um, Seven Center for Climate Change Law, the C Columbia uh, Climate School, the uh, SDSN, the UNIDO, and all of the partners in this uh, uh, important uh, endeavor. Um, together, let us uh, engage uh, in, in this insightful discussion and uh, I wish you all the success of the event. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. That was a, a great summary of all the key topics we're going to talk, talk about today. Um, our last keynote uh, welcoming remarks uh, will, I think, actually be uh, provided by my colleague, Frank Wang, along who works from the GuideCo. Uh, GuideCo has been a trusted partner with SDSN for many years now. Uh, we hosted the event yesterday with them, um, and I'm just really excited to welcome Frank uh, to give his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Actually, um, it's uh, um, um, it's my great honor to uh, deliver uh, opening remarks on behalf of uh, Dr. Cheng Zhiqiang, uh, Executive Secretary for Cooperation of GEDCO. Distin distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, on behalf of GEDCO and Dr. Chen, it's, oh, it's our great honor to be invited to, invited to be the, one of the co-hosts today and uh, invited to participate in this uh, very interesting and very meaningful discussion today. Then yesterday, uh, as you know, uh, we had just concluded a very successful side event, which is co-hosted by GEDCO, uh, SDSN, uh, ESCOA, uh, UNECE, uh, UN ESCAP and OLADE. And um, at yesterday's event, we Agatico launched successfully a report on Global Electricity Development Index, which has got positive international feedbacks. Today, we continue to discuss topics of common interest, which is energy transition, and uh, great interconnectivity. At present, as we know, 
the time to implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is halfway through, more than halfway through. But the progress of most goals, most of the 17 goals, is not optimistic, according to the latest UN report. Resource scarcity, climate change, and population without electricity are most important factors, and the most important factors impacting social and de uh, economic development. So there are concerns that we are lagging behind in many of the sustainable development goals. Establishing a new energy system dominated by renewable energy is the golden key to solve these problems and move forward to a sustainable future. At last year's COP28 for climate change, countries reached a consensus that we need to phase out fossil fuels and promote global energy system transformation. Pledging to countries are pl have pledged to double the current global installed capacity of renewable energies by 2030. GATCO is an organization to promote global energy interconnection. As a matter of fact, the global energy interconnection is an important platform for large scale development, allocation, and utilization of global clean energies. In the production side, at the production side, it promotes the large scale coordinated development of various power sources like wind, solar, and uh, even conventional resources. In the allocation side phase, by building a strong, intelligent power grid, it achieves larger scale, optimal allocation and the safe supply of clean energy. In the consumption phase, it promotes the replacement of coal, oil, and gas in final consumption with clean electricity on a large scale, promoting the electrification of energy consumption. Currently, the global energy interconnection has been included in the policy recommendations of uh, policy recommendation reports of the United Nations high-level political forum for six consecutive years. Ladies and gentlemen, GATCO is committed to promoting the construction of global energy interconnection and promote promoting sustainable energy development as its mission and vision. It is dedicated to building an international cooperation platform for consultation, joint construction, and sharing. Its GATCO's network covers five continents. And we have more than 1,300 members from 142 countries. Looking into the future, the uh, GATCO is willing to work together with all parties to deepen exchange and cooperation, jointly promote the construction of global energy interconnection, and jointly promote global energy transforma transformation and sustainable development. So we have four proposals. First, to jointly promote green development. Second, jointly promote interconnection. Third, jointly promote technological innovation. And fourth, build a cooperation platform. Finally, I wish this uh, the discussion today a very successful one and uh, I hope you enjoy the discussion today. Thank you. All right, thank you, Frank. Um, so for the next segment, what's gonna happen is we're gonna have um, some remarks and a presentation that are gonna serve as the thought provoking content. And then we're gonna invite a panel up that are gonna have a discussion around some of that content. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to invite Ms. Li Dan uh, from the China Renewable Energy Industries Association to come up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. 
Uh, I'm honored to take part in today's meeting and discuss the cooperation and uh, uh, competition in energy transition based on the regional experiences and best practices. Uh, before I talk about our work in this area, uh, please allow me to briefly uh, introduce my organization first. Uh, Chinese Renewable Energy Industries Association is well known as CREA by many renewable energy sector folks. Uh, CREA was established with the support of GEF uh, through the China Renewable Energy Commercialization Program. This program has been supporting China's effects in promoting renewable energy applications and development since the 1990s. Uh, established in 2002 as an NGO, our mission is to accelerate renewable energy applications and development to promote energy transition and support low carbon energy uh, development. To accomplish such mission, create bridges cooperation between government and enterprises, set up a long-term platform for industry exchange, uh, exchanges and uh, academic research uh, collaborations, both inside China and, and with the world. Korea has uh, uh, witnessed and uh, uh, taken part in development of China's renewable energy industry from uh, scratch to world largest as well as how it has uh, continuously advanced and support China's energy transition. I begin with the introduction of Korea and its history because it is an outcome of international collaboration. Uh, then I hope to share my thoughts about today's theme by talking about a few uh, key tasks that uh, Korea has had done to support China renewable energy development. First, I'd like to talk about the foundation of China's renewable energy development, uh, which is the renewable energy law. The law was released in uh, 2005 and come into effect uh, on, gen uh, on January 1st, uh, 2006. This law was established a series of core mechanisms uh, including renewable energy full amount uh, uh, acquisition by grid companies, electric electricity price subsidies, and the cost sharing through the uh, the 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 surcharge. These mechanisms these mechanisms provide a solid foundation for the rapid development of emerging renewable energy industries, particularly when it was not competitive in a market and the beginning, at the beginning. When form formulating this policy, China looked at the advanced policy mechanism from countries such as Germany, uh, Denmark, and, and others. Moreover, China received strong support from the World Bank, GEF, and a number of foreign experts. We are very grateful for the important support given by the international community during China's initial stage of renewable energy development. Uh, through, in, uh, through innovation in technologies and the business models, China uh, con contentedly dropped down the cost of renewable energy. The generation costs are now comparable to fossil fuel at power plant, providing the most uh, cost effective low carbon energy solution uh, globally. Now we, we would like to share the Chinese experience and the capacity in renewable energy development with the world to uh, advance global energy transition and hopeful, hopefully at the, at the lowest possible cost. And next, uh, I want to talk about the competition. Uh, I think competition is, uh, act is, uh, is actually a very attractive term. It is one of the core elements of market economy. 
which brings higher quality and uh, efficiency and encourages innovation. The essence, uh, essence of energy transition that we discussed today is uh, innovation actually. And innovation only exists, exists in comp uh, competitive environment. Uh, without comp uh, comp uh, competition, we would just stay in the com uh, comfort zone. Therefore, competition is a uh, inherent driving force for energy transition. The competition in China's renewable energy industry is very intense. For example, in the wind power air, uh, sector, we have experienced uh, we have uh, experienced comp uh, competition between two de uh, two de uh, different uh, technological routes direct drive and uh, double fed uh, uh, induction generator in the solar pv sector there has been competition between mono uh, crystal crystalline and polycrystalline uh, technologies now there is also competition among uh, different solar cell technologies. This kind of competition span both uh, subsidized uh, and unsubsidized period. Uh, whether it was during in uh, in the initial uh, subsidized subs 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 uh, period or in today's unsubsidized environment. We have seen significant cost re uh, reduction trend in China's renewable energy solutions. Without this kind of competition, we couldn't have provided the most cost e effective low carbon energy solution for the world. Therefore, we hope we hope that the countries around the world can recognize the uh, the positive impact. Uh, brought, uh, brought by competition and we should strike a balance between uh, com competing on the strengths while cooperating and uh, weakness to leverage their respective advantage through cooperation within comp uh, competitions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dan. Um, some of the, the legal precedents that would enable that transition, the free market competition and the cooperation. So those are some great themes that we can pick up on throughout our conversation. Um, next, I'd like to invite Dr. Song Falong from Guideco to come up to give a presentation. Just okay, thank you. Honorable delegates, a team audience, my dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of GEDICO, uh, today I'm honored to share with you our research findings in the global renewable energy development moves. Uh, as we all know, the high quality Utilization of renewable energy will help us build a modern energy system and provide solid support to UN SDGs. In recent years, the renewable power capacity is seeing an increasing fast, fastest growth at COP28. More than 100 countries have promoted to triple the renewable capacity by 23. However, we are facing uh, challenges in the intermittency of new energies, uh, security of power supply and the grid expansion. To address these issues, we not only require a wide range acquisition of remote renewables 
but also the distributed generation near the low center, uh, which are all included in gap code research and the mode innovation. The fourth innovation mode is called development of hydro, wind, and solar. This mode is proposed for regions with rich hydropower, whose feasibility can be used to support the wind and the solar. Uh, here show two typical cases. Uh, based on this development mode, the 300 gigawatt of hydropower in the southwest of China can support up to 900 gigawatt of wind and solar. And the similar case is happening, happening in Garaza of Kenya, uh, solving not only the power shortage in the dry season, but also uh, creating more jobs. This slide shows us the new type of pumped storage, uh, which is the uh, newer concept and a technical solution for this mode. This uh, water and power product that able to realize water transfer and energy storage in, the, in a coordinated way by separate pumping and generation of studies show that 650 gigawatt of new, uh, new time pumped storage pumping generation in the West China can provide two terawatt flexibility and transfer 40 billion cubic meters of water. According to FAO, 55% uh, uh, of water population still face water shortage. Growth basin uh, water transfer based on our new pump storage technique can help to provide integrated solution for problem, problem for water, energy, poverty, and hunger. Our second mode innovation is called development of power, hydrogen, and carbon, designed to use green hydrogen, uh, ammonia, and methane productions uh, as flexibility resource to support the renewable power generation this mode will increase the use of green electricity and hydrogen, help to decarbonize the energy intensive industries and promote the green hydrogen based chemical industries. This mode is suitable to use in North China, West Asia, North Africa, and Australia based on future tech progress and the cost redu uh, reduction. Uh, for example, uh, Northwest China is packed to be the center of green hydrogen production, uh, reach, reaching 60 million tons in 2050, uh, which can support 1.2 terawatt of renewable generation and reduce 1.3 billion tons of CO2. The other case is the Neomo city project of Saudi Arabia, where uh, four gigawatt of renewable generation are developed in, in Sinaj with 2.2 gigawatt of green hydrogen and ammonia production. The last mode innovation I will introduce today is the integrity the development of offshore wind power clusters. Uh, this mode utilized offshore wind power and then integrated into the uh, adjacent onshore power grid. Uh, offshore wind power is difficult to build, operate, and deliver, and requires high investment. To address these issues, we are, protect, uh, we are expected to enlarge the turbines, use new tech, such as low frequency transmission, grid forming control, and improved submarine cables. The key, uh, the key, future, uh, the key features of this mode, as you can see in the picture, step by step, the offshore wind is developed 
from shallow to deep, from near to fossil, and from skeleton to fatality, eventually we may have the networked and in the grid offshore DC grid in the future. In addition to, in addition to that, uh, offshore energy island can be created by integrated offshore wind power, ocean energy, offshore PV, and other forms of energy together. We can also have a wind power plus industry uh, called development with hydrogen production, seawater, desalination, and the disc center. We believe based on the communist effort of the three modes, we can promote the diversify and high quality development of renewable energy and accelerate the global energy transition. According to our projection by 2050, global renewable power capacity will reach 28 terawatts, sharing 75% of the total number. To conclude my presentation, I hope the three modes innovation we propose today will be a good example and contribute to the global sustainable development. Gatico will always welcome and look forward to further discussion and exchange with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Song. Uh, it's really exciting to see a presentation that actually covers hundreds of gigawatts projects, right? These are really talking about scale. Um, so I'd now like to invite our three panelists to, to come up. Um, so Kasik Deb is a former senior researcher at the Center on uh, Global Energy Policy here at Columbia. Uh, Yao Ni is a deputy director of the International Department at the All China Environment Federation. And Yao Wang is from Peking University and also from GuideCo. Welcome. And Kashik, I believe you're going to help us moderate here. Uh, <laughs> yes. Great. As some of you might notice, uh, despite what Dean Sharman said, I'm not Melissa Lott. <laughs> but I'll try my very best to kind of fill in those really, really important and thoughtful shoes. Uh, this, is, uh, this is kind of an interesting development since I've been doing energy for the last 25 years. That, uh, let's say before COVID, five years back, the only people who would talk about geopolitics were folks who in the oil and gas business. I mean, you didn't expect geopolitics to be such an important issue in, say, the electricity sector or when you're talking about solar or wind. But between the shocks that COVID has given as well as conflicts around the world, we increasingly now kind of seem to think about everything, whether that be solar panels or wheat exports through the geopolitical lens, which kind of also kind of brings me back to the fact that my training as an economist almost always relies on obtaining the perfect economic model, the most efficient model that would deliver a certain outcome. And then you come to the real world where that may not be the only consideration or that may not be the really realistic consideration. And you have to kind of think about other things much more cleverly and intelligently. And hopefully kind of we get to do some of that uh, during the discussions today. Um, Wong, if I start with you, uh, give us give us your sense of what are the geopolitical constraints around the world today? What do you think are the biggest barriers? And uh, how I mean, how does this interesting balance between competition and cooperation kind of sit there? Okay, uh, thank you for raising this important question. This is a big question, but I like to come to a very specific thing, say uh, policies on EVs. Um, yesterday, actually, I plan to also talk about the industrial policies on EV, uh, electric vehicles. Um, in fact, uh, the UNIDO uh, recently launched the Industrial Development Report 2024, and I had the privilege to get involved in preparing that important report. And I think that that's a very great report because if we really think about SDGs, right? So uh, the goal number seven, uh, affordable and clean energies. Goal number eight, decent work and economic growth. And uh, goal nine, uh, number nine, which is 
industry, innovation, and infrastructure. If you think about these three goals, I think the EV contribute a lot to all of these three goals. So it's a good thing. Um, and I have uh, the, the pleasure of working with my co-authors on an academic paper about the industrial policy, China's industrial policies on electronic vehicles. How can that sort of you know, uh, be successful? If we think about China's uh, traditional fuel vehicles, it is not that successful. It got even a lot more subsidies from the government, but it, but it didn't work out. How come EV can work out finally? So uh, my research basically tells me, well, if we compare you know, uh, traditional fuel vehicles and EVs in China, um, in fact, EVs have some comparative advantage. They use a you know, common term uh, advocated by Professor Justin Lin, my boss uh, at the Institute of New Structural Economics. Because if you think about the traditional fuel uh, vehicles China, for China, more than 70% of the gasolines consumed are imported. Um, and, but, but, and, 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 you know, but when we come to the EV, electric vehicles, China sort of have the rich resources on some key minerals that are used in the batteries like cobalt, you know, uh, iron, and lithium. So this is kind of from a natural endowment perspective, China, uh, the EVs has more compare advantage than uh, um, traditional fuel vehicles. And the second come to the factor endowment. So, you know, because EVs are quite capital intensive, both you know, in terms of physical capital, also in terms of human capital. And for China, because of the quite, you know, um, remarkable economic growth in the past 55 years with annual growth rate of like nine to 10% every year. So China has accumulated a lot of physical capital and also um, in terms of the human capital increase, I think it's also quite remarkable. And and Remember, China is a large country. So you can, although the average year of schooling might be not that high, but you are able to attract all the talents to the city, Shenzhen. And then that city is full of skilled people. I, and so, so in terms of those, you know, fact endowment, uh, I think the EVs also, you know, that's also good for EV. And third, I would say the institutional endowment. I think China's government is quite committed to supporting, uh, to support this, uh, EV, uh, and you know, you know that China has a five-year plan. And I think that, that China has enough uh, state capacity to really try to uh, support, give very consistent and continuous support uh, for that, uh, for that, uh, uh, for the industries. Uh, so, so this is something I'd like to highlight that you know, for EVs, I think it's happened to be consistent with, with China compare advantage. And, and, then, and, and then the China, so industrial policies on EVs can be roughly divided into four stages. Uh, sorry for you know, give you a long answer, but I think it is it's, it's it seems interest and important to to tell why for some reason you know China's EV industrial policies I think work. Um, I think the, the the industrial policies on China's EVs can be roughly divided into four stages. The stage number one is really the the bottleneck is the technology on the battery. That is the key. Without that, you cannot even get started. So China's government spent a lot of money in a sub, you know, subsidized R&D on batteries uh, in those research institutes and also some of the big companies. Uh, and, and I think that's the right decision. And after years of, that is started around 2001. Okay? And after years of experiment R&D and there was just some breakthrough in, uh, in batteries. And actually, you know, the boss of BYD, Wang Chenfu, he's a battery you know, producer at the beginning. He knew nothing about the vehicles, okay? Um, and, and so, so, so the, then the second stage for China industrial policy in the EV industry is really how to promote production. If you do not produce cars, then you cannot kind of, you know, increase productivity through, you know, learning by doing, and you cannot get this process started. You have to produce something. So China then, Government has come up with the policy called 10 city uh, 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 thousand cars. That is, they choose 10 cities. For each city, they, the goal is like very modest, like 1,000 electron vehicles. But even that goal is not really fulfilled. Um, the, 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 but the government really tried to subsidize 
the, the, the EV producers uh, to produce more. And actually, then there are some subsidy fraud. Oh, uh, serious subsidy fraud. And some cars that do not really produce EV, they say, subsidize me, I'm producing EVs, and they got subsidies. And then there's media sort of you know, uh, find out and the big fraud, and, and then many economists criticize the industrial policy. Look, this is industrial policy. You should, you should just stop doing everything. Uh, so this is so bad, you're wasting money, money of, of taxpayers, et cetera, et cetera. But I think, I think that is technology loophole. So the government later on, they increased the technology bar uh, for firms to get subsidy. So they really check the engine, whether you're really producing EVs or not. So that loophole actually you know, fixed quite soon. But because of the government subsidy, then you know, there's some leading companies like BYD, they really producing cars. And when they're producing cars, uh, at that time, it's mainly the city of Shenzhen, you know, that the government is sort of, they purchase, they, they provide the demand, okay? Uh, and so then, you know, you, you're running and, and you're selling and, and you, you, you get money back and, and subsidize your R&D and improve your productivity. So gradually, you know, the productivity of EVs increased, increased, okay? And then, like, you know, in order to have a full development of EVs, you cannot just rely on government demand. That is small. We have to stimulate the whole private demand, right? So then the third stage, the industry policy toward, the, the focus of industry policy shifted to how to boost private household demand. So then, the government issued policies such as, you know, you need to deploy more charging stations. And also, you know, for big cities like, like, like Beijing, if you buy, buy a new car, you have to wait a long, long time to get car license. But the Beijing government issued a new policy. If you purchase EVs, you do not need to wait. You get the car license immediately. And you can drive every working day. You know, uh, uh, you know in, 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 in Beijing, typically, you know, if you, my car a plate ends up at number eight. So one of the five days I cannot drive, okay? But if you have uh, EVs, you can drive every day. But now the policy has changed. But at that time, it really helps. So all those policies really help boost the demand, okay? Private demand. And the, the, you know, the, 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 the household typically, they, they do not, they need, to, they, need to, they need to incubate their product awareness. Before they really use the you know EVs, they do not realize that you know uh, charging uh, you know the, the the vehicles is a lot cheaper than refuel the oils uh, with the gasoline, right? So you have to show them, and gradually uh, the you no know, the 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 consumers say, wow it's quite convenient, uh, it's 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 cheap, it works, and and it's it's not bad, uh, and and it's green. So uh, so 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 gradually the the demand comes up, and then. Right, you know, the, the market competition and, and, and the supply demand. Let me emphasize, all those competitive producers are all private firms. They're very working very hard. The market competition is, is fierce, is indeed fierce. And, 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 and also China has a very important policy that is uh, let uh, 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 Tesla in. We're 100% foreign owned. That is remarkable because before Tesla, for any foreign companies, if you want to make foreign direct investment in China, China, you have to, you can only have the joint venture and the China, China side has to have the controlling share, 51%. But for Tesla, an exception, 100% Tesla, okay, in Shanghai, it's a big thing. So the idea of the China government, okay, we want to introduce the best sort of, you know, uh, company in, in this field and then just let it compete. So, so and, and hopefully, and the Tesla also can bring in the sole supply chain, et cetera. But, you know, uh, and different from um, uh, traditional fuel vehicles, which suffer a lot from local protectionism. Because, you know, if you go to Shanghai, if you take a taxi, uh, these are kind of Volkswagen. It's the Volkswagen invested in Shanghai and they have a joint venture. If you go to Beijing, it probably is Hyundai, okay? So they, they, you know, because those joint ventures, the local government has kind of a local protectionism. But such kind of problems are not that serious for EVs. Because the EVs, you know, if you're successful, you really work for, throughout the, the country. There's no much 
uh, local protection. I think that is also the reason why EVs are more uh, successful than traditional fuel uh, uh, cars. So, and, and then the, the last stage of industrial policy, because, okay, now the firms are viable. Uh, and so then the subsidy gradually decline. Okay. And, and it just, just the government need to regulate. So, so make sure the market works. So that is the fourth stage. Uh, I think those, uh, 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 even without subsidies, these leading companies can, can survive, uh, can make profits. So I give you a very long sort of account of how the industrial policy evolved. But if you look at how that policy changed, it's really, I think the government uh, is playing a very important role. So depending on the key bottleneck for that industry at different development stages, the focus of industry policy is also, also switch. Sometimes government does make a mistake, but the question is, can you really quickly rectify your mistake and make sure that the general direction is the right direction. So I think, I, I think you know, from this, I think the for like this uh, uh, new energies, which suffer from common sort of, you know, externalities because of the human, you know, you, you have this external positive externalities, you have the innovation externality, you have asymmetrical information. All these macro failures suggest that we need a facilitating state. We need both efficient market and facilitating state. I think uh, China's, uh, industrial policies on EVs is really a case in point. And I think that also tells me at least you know, why the industrial policies on traditional fuel vehicles in China are not as successful, why EV is successful. And, and I think this might also uh, be useful for us to think about uh, useful industrial policies for other clean technologies um, uh, uh, and renewable technologies. So let me stop here. Thank you. Thanks. I mean, this was this was really fascinating, and however long, but very quick summary of what could work, how should it work, and what are the possible lessons that one would get from China. And thanks for reminding us also how big China is. It's always a helpful recognition of the fact that there's a huge amount of work on energy transition that's going to happen, and for better or worse, the overwhelming majority of that is going to happen in the developing world. Uh, and that's really where a large part of our focus should be. That's where kind of my research also sits. But let me use the last few minutes that we have left, uh, pass on the mic to you, Mr. Yao Li, and get your perspective of what you think is holding back the energy transition. Okay, and I think Mr. Wang already have a very long story about this, and uh, I think it's a very good case and explain how, how, how successful this uh, EV in China. And from my perspective, because I'm coming from the NGO side, the CSO side, so uh, just like uh, Mr. Wang mentioned, there's the successful of a new technology really need, really need some the social momentum and uh, there, and this is what happened here. And uh, for our NGOs, I think we can promote this uh, energy transition from two uh, aspect, aspects. And the first part is from policy side. I think that uh, lots of the, the policy, uh, also including that there's the number part, like that you can only driving by four days uh, each week. And this is coming from, I think it's a, it's a industry NGO and promote this kind of policy there. And uh, also the other part is because uh, like the EV and like, like the solar panels and this is on the back end, this, there needs consumers to really consume this kind of new technology. But uh, there's a lot of gap, like awareness, like the behaviors, they really need NGOs to promote to change. For example, uh, we have some programs in the, I think the Shanxi province or in the, the west part of China. And the, you cannot imagine there's a <clears throat> very ridiculous uh, reason that maybe some farmers do not want to use the solar panel on their roof is because they thought that maybe they cause some healthy problem. And that, that's the result. Some of the NGOs really try to fix this problem. And they have lots of the educations so that to talk about how clean the energy is and uh, will not cause any health problem. And uh, it's easy to implement it. But lots of these things. And also we have some programs to, to promote this kind of the, the EVs and also promote the low carbon transportation in, in the, some the regional, in some cities. And there's lots of the, the details problem there. Uh, like some people just do not to always drive the private car instead of public transportation. It's maybe because some details uh, problem like there's not enough seats in this uh, public transportation stations something like that. So, and this details things that need NGOs to join this moment and to promote the energy transition there. Yeah. 
Thanks. I mean, really a very helpful perspective again mm -hmm. from a very important actor, part of the energy transition, the role that governments and can play in facilitating the energy transition and how the civil society becomes an important actor in making sure that uh, government policies actually get communicated and delivered on the ground. If I can just kind of take you up on the role that civil society organizations can play. Mm -hmm. In today's day and age, it's almost inevitable that every piece of information will be magnified and spread uh, multiple, many more times than it would have been with traditional media, where things like Twitter and LinkedIn, the ability of the ability of the truth seekers to kind of communicate mm -hmm. is almost as large as people who would want to either propagate rumors or misinformation. Mm -hmm. Where do where, where does this conversation sit in your experience in terms of energy transition? In terms of, for instance, the example that you were giving about solar panels causing health problems. How I mean, how how does the role of social media through civil society organizations become important here? Yeah, I think and as you you really, you really mentioned a very important point. In fact, that rumor about the the health problem about the solar panel is coming from the social media. I think it's a TikTok, I guess. Oh, China's doing and <laughs> and so, I don't know that some people really don't understand the technology, but they want to attract more people to to visit their account. So they they just make this rumor. And uh, and uh, I, I think the, now now uh, my organization is trying to do something about this kind of low carbon communication, low carbon communication part, and re really educate some NGO to, to have new t uh, have some technicals to, to, for, on the social media to let let the let, uh, let the residents, let the people in China to understanding this the climate change things and, let, and the the new technology about the energies and uh, and we're trying to do uh, to do lots of trainings for for that and. Uh, Mm, but uh, you know that the NGOs, uh, the local, especially the, the local NGOs, although they are really good at to um, maybe build up uh, communities in the local area, but uh, they are not familiar with you know, just like you mentioned the social media, and uh, they're, they're, they're really there is a gap there. So we really do uh, need to do lots of things. And then my organization really act like a, a hub or a big network of the old NGOs in China. So we're, we're trying to do, do something there, but there's still a long way to go. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so information is almost completely 100% mobile globally, right? Mm -hmm. Allegedly, that's supposed to be the case with capital as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, clearly, we've see, all seen numbers about how much the energy transition is going to cost and how much more investments are required in all of these new technologies. Well, if I kind of take you back to your doctoral work, you kind of describing very interesting comparisons between India and China in how their ability to attract FDI in very, very meaningful and chunky manner differed quite considerably when you did your doctoral work. Can I ask you to look back to that young student who was doing that PhD at that particular point in time and explain what your experience is around looking at FDI in new energies, especially for India and China and how do they compare? Okay, thank you for raising the question. <laughs> I chatted with you about my uh, PhD dissertation. I, I got my PhD from University of Chicago in 2009. A fine my, institution. Uh, thank you. And my dissertation is try to, uh, my JAMA paper tried to compare China and India to two large developing countries in terms of their performance on foreign direct investment. And at that time, I said, find, wow, no, China attracts 12 times more foreign direct investment than India. How come? Now, given, so for any sort of, you know, new classical explanation, if anything, we should predict that India attract more FDI than China. India speak English, India is a democracy, <laughs> and India, you know, uh, uh, and uh, India is uh, like the first, you know, it's a WTO member, first started from day one, 1995, China joined WTO in 2001. Um, you know, for cheaper labor, it's, you know, maybe India's labor is even cheaper. So, so, and, and then I, because I'm interested in economic growth. Um, and uh, and uh, for any people who work on growth or across country growth performance, well, China and India are often outliers. So sometimes you plot all the countries on, on, on the plot and say, well, yeah, if, let's just get rid of these two annoying outliers. But if you get rid of these two points, it means that you kick out 40% of total population on this planet. 
So it doesn't make sense. So, well, anyway, so I'm interested why, why China attract, managed to attract more foreign direct investment than India? Because for developing countries, foreign direct investment, it just not only means more capital, but also means more technology, more advanced technology. So it is crucial. So later on, I think, why the policy toward FDI is so different? Why China's government are, you know, have such a sort of friendly, uh, so, you know, the, the, the local government officials are going to directly negotiate with the potential foreign investors, say, come and visit in my town and I guarantee you this and I give you that. But that didn't really happen at the time. So I figured, wow, the government incentive is very important. Uh, and we have to figure out the incentives, both central government and the local government. These, these are two country, large countries. So, so central government and the local government, they choose different policy policy variables. Say, you know, TAFR rate and, and the corporate tax rate on foreign investment firms are chosen by central government. And, and TAFR revenue is basically collected by the central government. The local government, however, could, you know, affect your entry cost, but, you know, by choosing the infrastructure investment and so on and so forth. And, and, and the fiscal decentralization, uh, the, the, how the central local government share the revenues also matters. So all these things, that later on I've, I tried to say, well, uh, the one reason why China and our government uh, sort of an issue such friendly policy to, to foreign direct investment uh, than India is that China fiscal decentralization degree is somehow the middle range so that both central government and local government are happy uh, to, uh, to 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 benefit, they can and both benefit from from the foreign direct investment in terms of revenue. And also another important difference is that China's local government officials they are essentially you know uh, appointed by sen by the superior instead of elected by local people. And so in that sense, China's local government are less likely to be captured by local vast interest group like domestic car companies, so they are against the foreign competitors. Um, so that didn't really happen in China. So, so I'm gonna give you a kind of quite a detailed story about these two countries because I think nowadays, for example, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Yao Ning mentioned the solar panel uh, industry. I happen to also have a, a, a research paper on China's solar panel system. If we look at that, I think now China has built a large capacity in the solar panels and I think it has a great potential to help other countries on one belt, one road, uh, like West Asia uh, and other regions where they have abundant sunshines and they need the energy. And, and this is clean energy. And also, if you look at the solar, solar industry, the middle stream of the solar industry is assembly, which is labor intensive, which is industrialization per se. So China started the solar industry from this middle stream, because it, it used really China's competitive advantage, cheaper labor. So I think now, I think there is a great potential for international corporations uh, in, in, the, in the solar panel uh, area. So, uh, so how, you know, through this international collaborations, through foreign direct investment, then you know, China's, uh, uh, this production capacities on, on solar panels could be also beneficial to other countries on the one belt, one road. Uh, and that is not only just help them to build the clean energy, but help them uh, start industrialization as well. So that that's that's what I have. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. That's again, a very interesting example of how you can actually get something done, starting from where your comparative advantage is and how frankly different countries are in the world use their endowments more efficiently or less. I mean, there are kind of numerous examples around the world where this has always been a challenge. But there's one thing that kind of triggered a thought, and maybe if I can ask you, you know, to kind of weigh in on that. Foreign investment is, of course, kind of seen through a somewhat different lens by the local population, by the local labor force, uh, by officials, city officials who may have very different incentive structures from the central government who have kind of a more vested interest, I suppose, in growth and greater investment come in, whether foreign or not. But this perception of foreign investment and foreign activity across industrial activities could be an important consideration. We've kind of seen this so actively in the US where 
even close partners in Japan are unable to kind of come and invest extensively in a industry which is so central to the U.S. growth story, steel. What is, I mean, what, what's your experience in terms of how people kind of perceive some of these foreign activities, foreign investments, and does this vary across uh, energy transition technologies? In, in, in fact, from the non-profit field, I think uh, it, uh, we will have a topic about green, green investment, but uh, it's mainly about some campaign and research is from our, our, our field. And you know the NGOs in in China mostly they, they get some not not the, the investment usually we get some funding from like GF or something some like like this uh, this foundation is most lovely uh, coming into our field so that so that, so so I do not have lots of things about the investment part yeah that's uh, really things but uh, but uh, as far as I know as uh, from the GF and also GCF the International Climate Fund. And then in, in the recent years, and there's more and more funding coming to China and uh, the, the, to, to, to make more research um, about something that you mentioned about the low carbon communication in this part. And then we NGOs get a lot of funding about that. So to improve the communication in this whole scenario in China. Thanks, uh, Elena. I think, I mean, you would want us to leave these chairs now, right? Mm -hmm. I won't even attempt to kind of summarize the conversation that we've had. This truly is a knowledge trust that you have put together here. And thank you for kind of allowing me to be a part of this. And thank you to both my panelists who've been so illuminating and illustrative of what has been done and what can be done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kasik, for helping us moderate that as well. Um, that was really insightful. Um, I want to learn more about those subsidiary flows he was talking about and that corruption. That was fascinating. Um, so moving on, that was actually a perfect segue how that conversation went um, to our next presentation. So same format. We're going to have a presentation and then another panel, and then we'll end our event um, just so that we can actually discuss some of the content here. But I am really excited to introduce to you all Matthew Eisen. Eisenson, uh, Senior Fellow at the Renewable Energy Legal Defense Initiative at the Sabin uh, Law School here at Columbia. Um, Matthew was part of a team who authored a fantastic report just a few months ago on some common myths around the renewable energy transition. And he's gonna share a short presentation on some of that today. Um, and then we'll have a panel to discuss it. So Matthew, please. Just test this one more time. Yeah, I think you may have to. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, could we go to the next slide? Uh, and the next one. So I, I'm a lawyer by training. I worked uh, as an environmental prosecutor at the New York Attorney General's office for just over four years before joining the Sabin Center a couple years ago. And my work at the Sabin Center is focused on leading a project called the Renewable Energy Legal Defense Initiative. And there are two main components to this project. There is a research component. So we track local legal obstacles to getting renewable energy projects appro uh, approved. And we also more recently have been studying misinformation, which I'll talk about today. And then there's also a uh, technical assistance component. Could you go to the next slide? So we provide technical assistance to lawyers across the country who are providing pro bono legal support to local supporters of wind and solar projects. So in the United States, it's very common uh, to see local opposition to wind and solar projects. And often the local government officials who are elected by the local residents um, face a lot of pressure to block wind and solar projects. So what you see right here is a you know, small room packed full of people and matching t-shirts. And the teacher say, you know, no industrial solar plants on farmland. And you know, this is really common to see a scene like this. Um, but often instead of, you know, 10 t-shirts, it's literally 500. Um, and, you know, I used to think this was kind of silly, you know, like grown ups all showing up and matching t-shirts to, to local government meetings. Um, but if you actually go to one of these meetings, um, you, you understand why they do it. 
Um, you know, you walk into a meeting planning to, you know, deliver some remarks about why you support a solar project and you see 500 like black and yellow t-shirts that say, you know, no industrial solar and you, and, and you, you just, you know, that you'll get heckled and you might get approached in the parking lot afterward. And, you know, if you're a community member, people might berate you at the supermarket. Um, so it's a big deal. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Um, so in, in this presentation today, I'd like to connect a few dots. We're going to talk about misinformation, but I want to make the connection between misinformation about renewables, um, and particularly renewables. We'll talk about EVs a little bit too, but most of my work is on utility scale wind and solar. So I want to make the connection between misinformation about these technologies um, and opposition to the technologies and then how that opposition is affecting you know, where we are in the energy transition, particularly in the United States. Go to the next slide. Um, so the first topic that I, I'd like to cover, and I'll cover it pretty quickly, is you know how pervasive is local opposition to renewables in the United States? Um, can you go to the next slide? And the answer is it is extremely pervasive. So one of the things that we do at the Sabin Center is we publish a report that we update every year called Opposition to Renewable Energy Facilities in the United States. And it provides a state by state catalog. So for each of the 50 states, there's a separate chapter that describes all of the harshest restrictions against wind and solar that mostly local governments have adopted. And we also describe all of the ongoing lawsuits against wind and solar projects. And in each edition, we've seen bigger and bigger numbers. So in our latest edition, we have you know, around 400 local restrictions that are extremely severe that are blocking wind and solar and about 400 contested projects. And usually these involve lawsuits. Go to the next slide. Um, you know, as you can see from this map, which is from that report, um, these local restrictions are you know, all throughout the country. There's a you know, particularly um, strong cluster of them around the Great Lakes region in the Midwest. And a lot of it is that issue we were looking at, you know, no solar on farmland. This is a lot of farmland um, and a relatively small portion of it is being, you know, converted to solar, but there's a lot of opposition. Could you go to the next slide? You know, similarly with contested projects, we see them um, all throughout the country. Could you go to the next slide? Um, so here, you know, in total, uh, USA Today did a in-depth investigative uh, report on local opposition, looking at our report and also interviewing experts across the country and found that about 15% of counties in the United States have effectively stopped wind and solar development. Uh, next slide. Um, I wanna zoom in um, in a couple of places uh, because these, these local restrictions are not you know, all equal. Um, one state where we have seen extreme opposition is, is Ohio. So in Ohio, there's a state law enacted in 2021 that allows counties to declare themselves off limits to large scale wind and solar. And a lot of counties are doing this. So we, we already have 24 out of Ohio's 88 counties have effectively created, um, they've declared themselves off limits to, to, wind, to solar by creating these massive restricted areas and a similar number to wind. Next slide. I wanna zoom in on one of these restricted areas. So this is a, a place called Allen County, Ohio. And the red areas are, are where wind and solar are no longer allowed. The, the tan areas are the, the, the built up areas. These are the, the, the townships. Um, so you'd never be you know, building utility scale project in those areas anyway. And then the little blue zones uh, near the center, um, just under that town, township called Lima are where wind and solar are still allowed. In the next slide, this is another example from, from Michigan where there's been a huge amount of opposition to siting solar on farmland. So this, this township called LaSalle used to allow solar uh, um, in the agricultural zones. These are the green zoning districts, but now allows them only in the purple zoning districts, the, the industrial zoning districts, um, which are about 87 acres or 89 acres out of 17,000 in the town and half of that land is already developed. So they've effectively, you know, banned solar, but they're pretending they haven't, they're pretending they just allow it in the industrial districts that, you know, bear, basically don't exist. Uh, next slide. Okay, so that's how pervasive is local opposition. I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, how much does all this local opposition actually matter? Uh, next slide. So 
Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, this is one of the federal labs um, out in California, it put out a really important study in January of this year where they had surveyed um, just over 120 renewable energy developers. And they asked them a series of questions about, you know, how many of your projects are being canceled? How many are being delayed? You know, what is the, what does the opposition look like? You know, what's going on? And what they found was that, you know, at least 30% of projects are being canceled after the siting application has been submitted. So this is actually fairly long into the process uh, because, you know, before you get to a siting application, you negotiate for years over an interconnection agreement, but projects are dealing with so much opposition at the siting phase that they're getting canceled. Um, and also we're seeing, you know, even greater numbers of, of, of delays of six months or more. Uh, next slide. Um, and when they, when the researchers asked the developers, what are the main causes of opposition? Um, two out of the top three were directly related to local opposition. So, you know, one of them is local ordinances or zoning, and another is community opposition. And the local ordinances and zoning are all a direct result of people opposed to the project lobbying their local government to, you know, crack down on it and make it impossible. The third of the leading causes is interconnection, which you all know a lot about. Um, and it's not directly related to local opposition, but there is a connection because it's so difficult to build transmission in the United States and transmission projects often face local opposition. Next slide. So, you know, how is this affecting the, the energy transition? So the, the energy transition is, you know, continuing ahead in the United States. If you look at this chart of where we are in terms of cumulative solar installations, you'll see we basically had nothing in 2010, 2011, 2012. Um, and uh, the pace really picked up um, 2015, 2016, and, and, and has continued. Um, wind development has, has slowed down uh, in the United States, um, and a lot of the eastern states are very de uh, dependent on large offshore shore wind projects to meet their goals, and um, the approval process has been slower in those two. Uh, next slide. You know, what's driving this? Um, as you all know, the, the costs have dropped you know, precipitously. Uh, and that's the, that's the main thing driving it. Uh, next slide. Um, but uh, I think it's important, especially with you know such a strong Chinese delegation in, in the room, uh, to compare it to, to to China, where you know in in May uh, China installed about 19 gigawatts of of solar, um, while the U.S. installed about 2.4 gigawatts. So you saw in that that first slide of the the U.S. increase. Um, 2.4 is, is, is pretty good for the US in terms of past performance, but it's a, a, a tiny fraction of um, what could theoretically be, be achieved in a, a country of similar you know, land mass. Uh, next. Um, okay, so now, now on to um, you know, misinformation. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what's driving all this opposition and how much of it is because of misinformation and how does misinformation play into it. Uh, next slide. So that same Lawrence Berkeley lab study that I was talking about earlier, um, they asked the developers, what are the most common things that you're hearing from local opponents? Why do they oppose projects? And you see this extremely long list. And you know, we would call this throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. You make every possible argument you can about why a project shouldn't be approved. You know, It's ugly to look at, it will harm the wildlife, um, it's, it's too noisy. Um, it, it, human health impacts, just every possible reason. Uh, next slide. But then when they ask the developers, you know, what do you think is actually driving the opposition? And again, this is just the developer's point of view. The list, um, uh, it, it gets much narrower. And it's, it, it's the same much narrower set of issues uh, that seems to be driving opposition. And this is you know, visual impacts and community character, which are basically the same thing. It's the aesthetics of the projects. Um, concerns about residential property values. You know, if a solar farm is built near my house, will it affect the value of my house? Um, and loss of agricultural land um, and for wind sound. But some of these other things that, you know, had very long bars on the previous uh, chart, like wildlife and um, local environment and health effects, really drop off. Uh, next slide. So uh, you saw that slide earlier of the people wearing the matching t-shirts. Um, what often happens is that 
those people will uh, band together and create a website and a Facebook group. And this is an example of one of the websites uh, for Michigan. Um, the URL is no2solar.com. Um, and uh, the slogan here is protect our farms, say no to solar. Uh, next slide. And you'll see that these, these websites will usually have a tab about you know, impacts of solar um, and they're just packed with misinformation. So the three that I've called out here are, are just pure misinformation. There's this concern that you know, solar depends entirely on subsidies and if the subsidies dry up, the solar farms will be you know, abandoned and you'll just have to look at these abandoned solar farms forever. Um, the health impacts, you know, concerns about electromagnetic fields and I'll talk about that in detail. Um, you know, some of the concerns are nuanced, like, you know, maybe property value impacts or visual impacts, electromagnetic fields is pure misinformation. Um, and then environmental concerns, this last one, I'll actually read it out loud. Solar panels emit a substantial amount of heat, which negatively affects the environment. It is likely that solar farms are making climate change worse. Yeah, it, it, it comes up a lot. Um, next slide. So, you know, what's the impact of all of this? Um, it, it, it appears to be having an impact on, on public opinion. Um, and we have the strongest evidence of this impact in the offshore wind context, where in New Jersey, there was very high support for offshore wind um, just a few years ago. It, you know, as recently as, um, as 2019, 76% of people in New Jersey still supported offshore wind. And, and now it's down to 54% huge drop. And this has been at the same time as there has been a massive disinformation campaign um, trying to tie uh, whale deaths to, to offshore wind development. Uh, next slide. Okay, so now we'll get into the uh, report. Um, next slide. So we, we put out this report in April and um, updated it more recently in June called rebutting 33 false claims about um, solar wind and electric vehicles. Uh, and these, the, the false claims that we selected are, are largely the type that you saw on, uh, in those screen grabs from node to solar.com. And I'll talk about a few of them. Next slide. So first is this electromagnetic fields one. And I showed you an example from node to solar.com of this idea that the electromagnetic fields from, from solar farms are a threat to human health. Next slide. So here's how electromagnetic fields from solar stack up to um, you know, other sources of electromagnetic fields. So anything that has um, an electrical current has an electromagnetic field. Um, the acceptable exposure limit is about you know, 2,000 um, here and standing next to a commercial inverter, which is the part of the solar farm with the you know, highest amount of, of, of electromagnetic fields, it, you're at about um, 1,050 milligauss. So, you know, less than half of the, you know, ex acceptable maximum. But, you know, holding an electric can opener is, is, is far, um, has a far higher uh, electromagnetic field exposure. And if you get, you know, 150 feet away from, from one of these solar farms, you are below the average background level. So electromagnetic fields, really not an issue, but it, it comes up a lot. Next slide. This is um, been a more challenging uh, uh, one to confront, but there's this idea that solar development is a massive threat to farmland and farmers. Um, and it's, it's really not well-founded. Uh, next slide. So in, um, this is an example from the UK, um, which uh, is you know, different from the US in that they have so much less land. Um, in, the, in the US, we have you know, 900 million acres of farmland and the most wildly optimistic or wildly aggressive scenarios for solar development would require about 10 million. So that's 10 million out of 900 million. So, you know, about 1% of farmland if we put all of our solar on farmland. And, and we're not going to do that. A lot of it is going on deserts and other, other places. But even in a place that's much more land constrained like the UK, um, solar is just not taking up a lot of land and it's not going to. Um, you know, it's a fraction of 1%. So on the left, you see all of the UK land. 
um, there's one yellow box that says 1%. And within that, you see that the golf courses in the UK um, take up a lot more land than, you know, solar will in, in the next, you know, few decades, even under aggressive uh, development scenarios. Uh, next slide. And, you know, one other important thing that's going on in the U.S. is that there's a lot of dual use agrivoltaics um, combining um, uh, solar production and farming. Next slide. So that was solar. Um, on the on the wind front, um, there's this you know, very uh, pervasive um, claim that solar is a major threat, uh, that, that, sorry, that wind is a major threat to birds. Uh, next slide. Um, just to give a little bit of context here, and this is something I care about a lot. I've been a bird watcher for 24 years since I was 13. Um, there are about 20 billion birds in the US and uh, cats kill about 2.4 billion birds every year. Um, building glass kills about 600 million, but I've seen you know estimates that are as high as a billion. Um, wind turbines, and this is you know data from about 10 years ago, um, killed about 230,000 birds. And you know even if you say, oh, this is outdated, there will be 10, 10 times as many wind turbines and 10 times as many fatalities. You know it's still. 2 million instead of the 2.4 billion from cats. Um, okay. uh, next slide. And then uh, critically important here is just balancing, you know, the collision risk for individual birds against climate change impacts. So the National Audubon Society is one of the main um, bird related NGOs and they care a lot about climate change and they've done incredible modeling about how much climate change is affecting birds. So here's a, a very common bird species, the American goldfinch, that's currently found, you know, throughout a big swath of the United States, and and the red there are all of the areas where the the goldfinch um, could disappear with climate change. Um, you just you see them moving north to those blue zones where they hadn't existed before. So we could have goldfinches in Alaska. So at least they have somewhere to expand to. But next, but here with the the birds that are already breeding in in the Arctic, the, the picture is just much more grim. You know, semi-palmated sandpipers are still very common, but with climate change, they could lose all of that red. And you can barely even see the the orange that they would still have, but it's basically the, the highest ground in those Arctic areas. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this is the last, the last um, thing we'll touch on, but there's this idea that electric vehicles have a net harmful effect on the climate. And this is often presented as like a gotcha, like you environmentalists think electric vehicles are so great, don't you? But don't you know that the batteries are made in China in factories that get all their power from you know coal and then they get charged in the US by, uh, by power plants that are you know coal, um, but next slide. Uh, but there's been you know a huge amount of research on this, just hundreds of studies doing life cycle analysis and even under you know uh, the worst case scenarios, it, it it almost never comes out that EVs are worse um, for the environment uh, than combustion engines. Um, in, in large part because uh, EVs are just much more efficient at converting electricity um, to to movement. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else I I, I want to. Uh, say on this. Oh yeah, and then the other thing, you know, I showed that 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 graph earlier showing how fast you know China is installing um, solar, it, and it, it, this idea that all all the the EVs are being manufactured with coal power, um, it's uh, it, it's outdated and it, it's changing for the better. I'll stop there. Thank you, Matthew, so much. And I hope you will stay around for our reception because I'm sure people will have questions for you. And I just, as much as we all like to advocate for renewables, I think it's really important that we understand the other side and the messaging that is being said to our publics so that we can really advocate against it. Um, so I'm going to turn now to our final panel and welcome our panelists to come up as I introduce them. Um, so first off, Vijay Modi, uh, who uh, runs the engineering laboratory here at Columbia University. Uh, hey Gong from Baruch. College, City of University in New York. Uh, Yi Chen, Associate Director of the China Program at Climate Works Foundation. 
and Zhao, uh, Zhao, Zhao Jing, uh, branding director of, of the uh, Xiaomin airline. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay, this is outdated. Sorry, Dr. B, my apologies. Um, no, no, please come up. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I have an outdated program. Wonderful. Thank you. BJ, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Elena. And it will be hard to follow the amazing presentation, but I'll I'll try. So our topic, you know, a lot of it has already lot has already been said before today. And so here's I want to do a little bit differently. You know, I have two young children who say I talk too long. Like I can't say it in short. So I'm going to try to make questions, short answers, and go around more. Yeah, because, you know, we have a lot of young people in the audience. So, so, so we're going to, you know, do it that style. So I want to first start by introducing a little bit all of you. And uh, please excuse me um, if I don't get all the uh, name pronunciation uh, right. First of all, I'll start with Hey, because he was our own uh, Earth Institute fellow and now Climate School fellow a few years ago, and he is now teaching in the city, uh, followed work. So uh, he now is a professor at Baruch College. And, you know, as typical of the Earth Institute fellows, he's really combining sort of the technology side, the policy side, the finance side. So. Uh, welcome. Uh, next, we have uh, Ms. Chen from Climate Works Foundation, and we heard from Climate Works Foundation before. She is uh, Associate Director for the China Program. And we will, I have actually a um, lot of questions about the China Program myself because of enormous success that China has had in renewable energy. And then Professor B.A., is that fair? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. fantastic. So um, Executive Vice President of Xi'an Zhao Tong University and serves um, additionally as Deputy Jean, Dean, my apologies to you, uh, Party Chief and Dean of uh, Electrical Engineering. So a lot of past work in smart grids. So it's fantastic that we have another engineer here from electrical engineering who can sort of help unpack things. So, so, so with that introduction, let me get started. And I'm gonna first start with Hey, okay, on, on my left, okay. Um, so you have done a lot of work and I've seen some of the papers. You know, this panel is about integrating in renewables into the grid as well as on supply chain. Um, I mean, my question on supply chains is this, okay? And and please take it from there. You know, installing one kilowatt of solar panel in the US, one kilowatt, is anywhere, if you want to do rooftop, is anywhere from $2,000 to $4,000 for one kilowatt, okay? And for those of you maybe don't like kilowatts, you see the gray panel there, imagine two of those. You know, you try to install two of those, it's like my home, New York, 5,000, anywhere from three. The solar panel part of that 4,000 is $120, okay? Even if it became zero, you are still left with all the other things. Right, And yet, everybody is focused on the solar panel. Okay. So, so, so my, my question on this is, and, and all the jobs are in the other $3,000, right? Even if, you know, that's the installation cost, that's, you talked about permitting reform, regulation, soft costs, whatever you call it, right? Custom acquisition. Could you sort of a little bit highlight where the supply chain issue integrates with the costs and benefits, please. 
Uh, thank you, Vijay. Um, uh, your work has been an uh, inspiration uh, of my work, and uh, I really appreciate thank you for your support. And uh, it's my great pleasure to join the discussion. Uh, for your question, you have the hard cast and the soft cast. Uh, I will focus more on the hard cast part because soft cast in the US is, is permitting and the legal system, as Mass just uh, uh, mentioned, I uh, really appreciate that. Um, so for the hard cost pass, uh, US, about two thirds of the US solar panel is imported. Uh, that's the, the first number I want to share. And second, we really standing at the crossroad uh, that we continue relying on global supply chain or we manufacturing domestically. And this is a, a really critical point. We talked a lot on the uh, different aspects of uh, to create jobs, investments, local benefits. But at the same time, there's a big elephant in the room, which is climate change. Uh, if we take climate change seriously, we need deployed renewable energy at the speed and the scale it needed to address climate change. I'll show you some quick numbers. So according to International Energy Agency by 2050 to achieve net zero emissions, we need uh, about, uh, for solar is about 20 times, and for wind is about 15 times of their 2020 level. That's the scale, all in less than 30 years. That's the speed. And how we are going to achieve that, uh, that bring really capture uh, the dynamics, right? We have all the challenges, but at the same time, we have a big challenge, which is climate change and how we are dealing with it. Uh, so to answer those questions, it's hard questions. I, I don't pretend I have an answer for that. So my team and our collaborators really work together to provide some evidence. So what are the benefits and the costs to uh, to have a global supply chain versus manufacturing domestically. So from our research, um, which uh, Vijay also mentioned, published in Nature, that we found um, global supply chain really save countries billions of dollars. From 2008 to 2020, which is what uh, Matthew mentioned, the, really the exponential growth of a different country, including US, so global supply chain saves the US about 24 billion. And for China saves about 36 billion. And for Germany saves about 7 billion. And the three countries all together about 67 billion. So that's how much global supply, which means that without a global su supply chain for those three countries to install the same amount of solar, 67 billion is what they would have to pay. Uh, which means that basically we cannot achieve what we have already achieved and projecting the future without a global supply chain, solar price would be about 20 to 30% higher in 2030. So basically the conclusion is without a global supply chain, it's very hard, if not impossible for us to achieve our can I ask one yeah. question? Yeah. You, from the time you did the study, the cost of solar panel actually in China has really gone down. Does it mean that the overhead of supply chain has gone up? Few few years ago, you found that the cost is 20 to 30% higher. But that percentage may be of the cost yeah. at the that time. Do you think that percentage is higher now? Um, I haven't doing the follow-up study, but uh, based on our, our projections is we compare what we uh, have, we rely on global supply chain. If countries gradually move towards domestic manufacturing, that would be the percentage. Now that's already happening because it's already, you know, okay. yeah. So which means that we have a, uh, 
now we have a higher benchmark than what would be, then I would say your assumption would be right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I want to go now to Ms. Yi Chen. Um, I want to sort of, the question I want to ask is, so to differentiate rooftop solar and kind of small scale solar to the very large scale renewable, where you have a large wind farm or a large solar farm. And, you know, I want, if you can speak to what are the common misconceptions about large scale, so a large scale renewable integration. What are the common misconceptions? I will go with one misconception. I want to get your reaction, but you can speak to any misconception, right? You know, and this may not be a misconception either, but we are expecting to build, let's say, we read stories that in China, large, you need to build the solar farm. You need to build the big wind farm. But, you know, you have to also build at the same time the transmission, right? Or something. I always find it puzzling that I see a lot of articles. People expect those two things occur at the same time. I can never get a plumber and electrician to come at the same time, right? So some mismatch is natural, right? But over to you. So my, my question is, is this a real challenge that transmission or the project is not occurring at the same time or it's just a natural process? Over to you. Yeah, um, thank you uh, for your question. Um, uh, first, I would like uh, to comment on the uh, large scale um, project. Um, but at the same time, I also would like to uh, say there, uh, uh, say something about large scale uh, compared to decentralized uh, scale. So um, for large scale, um, uh, uh, solar and wind, I think it has played a very significant role in China's renewable development because China is very good at uh, planning, uh, especially for this very large um, uh, wind and solar farm. And actually China's uh, Chinese government has um, um, uh, 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 also planning a lot of these kind of transmission lines from the renewable basis to uh, the load centers um, in the um, in, uh, in the uh, southeast uh, part of China. Um, uh, I think um, uh, one main um, conception is whether this uh, this building more and more grid is the most uh, um, economic and sufficient way to um, um, to do so. Um, uh, because, um, uh, like ba based, uh, I, I'm not a researcher, but I found some results from the, uh, from the papers. So actually a lot of, uh, there are researchers already, um, comparing, uh, like whether to, uh, build this kind of transmission lines from the big bases to the load centers, um, like including these transmission lines or building more, coal power plants because China is very rich in coal uh, and also uh, or like um, to uh, to motivate um, this kind of uh, flexibility resources from um, uh, 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 this kind of uh, load shifting or um, or um, other like uh, battery storage uh, measures. They find out that actually building these transmission lines is not that uh, cost comparative that like compared to to others. So um, I think, um, of course, building more great lines is still important right now, uh, especially for uh, integrating those um, big, uh, like uh, utility scale um, renewables. But at the same time, we should also uh, uh, go to uh, find other solutions. Like to one is like to whether to move these kind of industry hubs to the to the uh, west part of China so they can more like consume locally um, and uh, uh, the other the other method also like um, whether we should install more this the de de decentralized renewable instead of like building more and more utility scale actually right now in China this kind of decentralized uh, solar, um, uh, projects actually account for more than 50% of total um, solar installation in China right now. So, um, uh, and uh, for the east, uh, east coast of part, part of China, actually they are actually um, would like to build more this kind of 
um like self-owned decentralized solar project instead of just like relying on uh, transmitting these renewables from the uh, west part to the east part. So fascinating. And I want to make one observation here. Last year, I think China installed maybe roughly 10 times the amount of solar than the United States. And we saw that. And of that 10 times, more than five times is at the distribution side, not at the utility scale, right? Because more yeah. than 50. Now, if you compare to what you just saw in the earlier slide, thank you, Matthew, was ours is maybe only 20% <laughs> is on the distributed side or even less. So out of our 30 gigawatt, maybe six are on the distributed side. For China, out of 300, 150 are on the distributed side. So if you compare that, so my question that to Professor B, you know, engineers, if you look at the smart grid literature, if you Google, you probably get a million citations, you know, in, in IEEE. We've been working on smart grid. Yet, we, at least in the US, not conversed on the question is whether for issues of transmission siting, whether for issues of dealing with extremes, and as we electrify our grid for heating, we are then our load will become also even more extreme because it, it will be related to the weather even more. Do you think we should be investing more on the distribution grid side, both on installation of solar, but also on smart grid compared to the transmission side? Now, I want to uh, provide one data point for New York City. New York City electricity used to be until maybe just five years ago, about 25 cents a kilowatt hour. Today, it is almost 40, so 15 cents more. Two-third of that extra investment is going to the distribution. And we haven't even installed solar. <laughs> we haven't even done the electrification of the scale. So. Customers are worried, you know, where is the smartness going? Is it just increasing our cost or will it reduce our cost? Over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Yeah, your question is quite uh, interesting. Yeah, just as you said in China, uh, yeah, uh, in the past, I think in the past 10 years, uh, the electricity, especially for the renewable energy, such as wind and uh, solar uh, from the west to east for the, for the transmit yeah, distance. Yeah. But in this last, yeah, last three years, yeah, especially the decentralized yeah, solar, just as yeah, Miss Chen said in China it's go yeah grew quite fast. Yeah, I I think it can answer your question. Yeah, for in China I think especially yeah for the yeah green energy yeah uh, if we want your operation yeah quite good for the power system maybe decentralize. Yeah, is the one solution. Uh, for the power system, yeah, maybe we can from the demand side, yeah, we can invest yeah some storage, uh, and the and some yeah some uh, uh, some so solution uh, for the balance. I think as to uh, not only for from yeah this from west to east. Yeah, I think it's... So, so can I yeah. ask a follow-up question mm -hmm. to you? Because I think you are hitting also spot on that 
maybe for resilience, if I hear correctly, and for the kind of low probability but high risk events. Mm -hmm. Are you so? Uh, two questions. One is, mm. how did China create the policy incentives for such dramatic growth in the distribution and rooftop side? That's one yeah. question. Okay. And the second question is. Is it going to require and be followed up with the need for storage also on the rooftop and distribution side? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. For the first one, yeah, first question for the roof solar. Yeah. I think in China, yeah, I think the policy is one side, but the reality, yeah, you, yeah, just as you know, in my hometown, yeah, Shandong province. Yeah, the decentralized roof solar yeah grows very very fast. I think that this not uh, be determined only by policy, but by the investment. You know, so I think a good sorry investment by home or by government. Like what investment? By yeah, by home and by the solar by the. How, how to see Man, solar installers? So, yeah, okay. solar investment. So yeah, they want to find uh yeah a good a good mechanism yeah for their investment. So, but the power system such as yeah such as state grade must be follow their investment. You know, yeah. So the for the distribution system now has been yeah met a very big problem for the operation your yeah, folder yeah folder yeah, yeah, yeah sorry for the how to the power system can operation good you know yeah so for their yeah, state grade they must follow their solar the roof solar so we gave them yeah such as the next question for the storage. Okay, so they give, but I think this cannot solve the uh, this yeah this good. So in for our in our your point of view, yeah, for the university, uh, we research. We must yeah from the demand side and the from the generation side must be balanced. Yeah, in the local, yeah, this, this is a solution. So I, I want to just in layperson term unpack mm -hmm. what Professor B has said. The incentives and policies allowed large scale installation of the distribution side solar. Now that create some problem in operation and the distribution company going to fix it. I want to contrast with what we do here. We do lots of studies first and anticipate lots and lots of problems before doing anything. Then the distribution company make a lot of investment, raise the tariff in the hope that somebody will install. So I'm just saying, this is, I just want to contrast. I, I don't know if I, I just want to contrast where we are, right? But we haven't installed much at all, but we are fixing the distribution system, <laughs> okay? So thank you for that answer. I'm just trying to compare the China experience with the experience here. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna to come to you again, uh, again. So let's, Left, oh, yeah. we have one minute left. Okay. <laughs> we're having so much fun. So this, okay. So this, we're going to end very soon. So on one last note, okay. You talked about the hardware side. So let's say you have studied the solar hardware supply chain issue. One issue is that of polysilicon supply chain, right? So that's one. Then the other issue is of all the machine tools that are needed to go from the polysilicon to that. And the third thing is sheer scale, right? When you have 100, or now I'm hearing 
close to a thousand gigawatt capacity to manufacture and you know the big companies and scale so they're learning with scale among those three things which battle should the u.s fight or have we lost all three battles over to you then <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but but back to the question uh, we are discussing, that it's fascinating that uh, there are benefits, there are challenges, right? Now is the point that we really need to find a way to work together to address the, the big picture question is how we are working together to address climate change. Uh, that's why uh, we are proposing to create a sustainable, resilient, and adjust global clean energy supply chain. So we can create a, a common framework that we all agree that we can work together to address the bigger questions that larger than just the geopolitics, just the local uh, investment, just the local jobs. Let's find something that we can work together. So, so Gang used to work at Stony Brook. Now he works at Baruch. Right? And yeah. Baruch is very close to the UN, so he's learning to speak like the UN. <laughs> so, on with, that with note, evidence based research. <laughs> on that wonderful note, we can end the panel and thank our panelists. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay, and all our panelists. Apologies that that was short, but please stay after. We can continue the conversation. Um, and now I'd just like to welcome up our final closing, uh, Cecilia Ugaz Estrada, the De Deputy Director General of UNIDO. Thank you so much for joining us and coming all the way up for the UN. We really appreciate it. Okay, distinguished, no, distinguished participants, panelists, experts, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today with you closing this event and let me also congratulate you because I think everything I heard so far has been extremely interesting. I would like to be very brief. I don't I don't think I'm going to be very brief. I would like to be brief because I know you are I'm the last hurdle between you and the networking and the cocktail reception, etc. So I, I suppose that you really want to move forward to continue this very interesting conversation. Um, at this year's uh, HLPF SDG 13 on climate action is one of the sustainable development goals under review, putting a just and equitable energy transition at the center stage. We know that the energy sector is responsible for over 70% of global greenhouse emissions. Uh, this year's global, global stock taking marks the completion of the UN Decade on Sustainable Energy for All and aims to accelerate the implementation of the SDG 7 of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The feedback on process on progress on both fronts is mixed and the challenges we face are daunting. Today, an unacceptable number of six, 660 million people are without access to electricity and a further 2.1 billion lack access to clean cooking technologies. Under current policy settings, we are expected to see a peak in fossil fuel use by 2030. For the last three to four decades, the share of fossil fuels has remained stubbornly high at 80% of the energy mix. This is now projected to drop to 70% by 2030 with current policies. With further ambition, it could decrease even more. While investments in clean technology and innovation increased by 17% in 2023, we still face a staggering financing gap of 3 trillion US dollars annually to stay on track with the goals of the Paris Agreement. The urgency to act is evident. The whole world recognizes the need to accelerate the energy transition and power sustainable economic development, yet turbulence and soaring energy prices are hampering the progress. We need concerted action at higher speeds and scale to meet the challenges of our times. We must accelerate the deployment of clean energy technologies to guarantee equitable access to energy and to create livelihoods for all. Furthermore, we must tackle the challenges associated with achieving the decarbonization of end use sectors, especially those involving heavy emitting industries responsible for around 22% of global CO2 emissions. Transitioning to renewable energy increases our reliance on essential minerals like lithium, vital for battery production. 
Remarkably, 85% of lithium reserves are located in indigenous territories. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples mandates obtaining their free, prior, and informed consent for land use. Our commitment to sustainable development necessitates honoring these rights and ensuring our advancements respect and actively include indigenous communities. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to start bringing a, close, a closer focus on solutions and industry is part of this solution. At UNIDO, we work with our member states and in collaboration with our partners from the UN family and around the world on implementing solutions to close the energy access gap and scale up energy efficiency and renewable deployment in industry. To accelerate progress, we focus on three priority enablers for energy transition, innovation, infrastructure, and new emerging technologies. Our global clean tech innovation program has supported over 1,300 startups in nine countries developing promising and investment ready innovative technologies and business models to speed up the energy transition and to create green industries. Through our work on green hydrogen, we're creating the necess necessary tools and guidelines to facilitate the adoption of green hydrogen and supporting countries in identifying opportunities for local development of green hydrogen clusters to create prosperity and build more resilient value chains for, for green hydrogen. Through initiatives like the Clean Energy Ministerial Industry Deep Decarbonization initiative coordinated by UNIDO, we are working on harmonizing the standards for low carbon steel and cement and motivating governments to commit to green public procurement on such materials. UNIDO recently launched the Global Alliance for Responsible and Green Minerals in cooperation with Saudi Arabia to promote a socially responsible and environmentally sound mining sector, aspects that are critical to the energy transition. Here, I extend an invitation to countries to join on this global effort. One of the key initiatives that showcase our collaborative efforts with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network is the Council of, Ener of Engineers for the Energy Transition, serving as a sounding board to the UN Secretary General and UN System co-led co -led by UNIDO and SDSN. The CET brings together leading engineers and technical experts from around the world to provide practical solutions and technical guidance for accelerating the energy transition. This council focuses on integrating cutting edge engineering practices with sustainable development goals, ensuring that the transition to renewable energy is both efficient and inclusive worldwide. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to bring more of such actions today. The success of the 2030 Agenda relies on the actions that we take now, actions that drive sustainable development and economic prosperity through the utilization of all talent and, importantly, actions that leave no one behind. UNIDO is committing to working with you all to achieve our sustainable development and climate goals, and I invite you to join us on our various programs and contribute to our steps towards progress. I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to the esteemed engineers of the Council of Energy for en the Engineers for en Energy Transition, some of them present here today, for the unwavering com commitment and invaluable contribution to advancing our understanding and implementing of re and re implementation of renewable energy solutions. Your dedication is truly inspiring and pivotal to our collective efforts towards sustainable future. Thank you. In closing also, I would like to express our deep gratitude to the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network for organizing this vital event, your leadership and dedication to advancing the global dialogue on renewable energy and sustainable development are truly commendable. Thank you, SDSN, for your continued partnership and support. so much. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and uh, close our session. Thank you all for being patient and for uh, all of your attention today. Um, so we will now physically move to our reception. Uh, it's in room 477. It's basically just below us. Um, I have some very uh, helpful colleagues in the back of the room that will guide you. Um, and I welcome you to please join us for some hors d'oeuvres and beverages and continue the conversation. Thank you.